Uh, uh, good afternoon, and uh, everyone. Uh, let me first of all thank the organizers for inviting me to give this uh, uh, presentation, which is going to address the changing HIV epidemic in Uganda uh, through research and uh, uh, capacity building. And this is going to be, in the next 15 to 20 minutes, this is going to be a brief, uh, an outline of what I'm going to talk about. I'll talk about our institute, the Uganda Virus Research Institute, and the MRC uh, unit, uh, the HIV epidemic, briefly, and the HIV research that we're doing in a multidisciplinary approach to address the changing epidemic, uh, some of the capacity building activities, uh, a brief on the Ebola work that is going on, and the contribution to uh, policy. For those who have been, not been at the Uganda Virus Research Institute, we are based in Entebbe, central Uganda, near Lake Victoria. Um, this institution was established in 1936 by the International Division of the Rockefeller Foundation as a Yellow Fever uh, Research Institute, and it was a joint venture with the government of Uganda. Uh, it became the East African Virus Research Institute, 1950. 1977 became the Uganda Virus Research Institute. And more than 26 new viruses were isolated at the Institute, including those that are listed here. Some may be familiar, like West Nile uh, virus and uh, maybe Chikungunya virus. And also, a lot of work was done on understanding the transmission of uh, uh, yellow fever at the Institute. Since 1986, when the HIV epidemic uh, hit our country, our activities have mostly been uh, on, on HIV, but of recent, there's a lot of work that is uh, beginning on uh, uh, global uh, security, looking at emerging and re-emerging infections. The MRC unit, uh, uh, to which I'm associated, is uh, a collaboration, or it is really a, col a collaboration between the MRC UK and the, the Minister of Health through the Uganda Virus Research Institute after a bilateral agreement in 1988, uh, following a request by the government of Uganda to come uh, and assist Uganda in addressing the HIV epidemic. And at that time, we got many international partners that came to work with us. It's part of the wider Uganda Virus Research Institute with a semi-autonomy. And in 2005, it was upgraded to an MRC unit. Uh, there are a number of MRC units, and two are outside the UK. The one in Uganda, and the largest and the oldest is in the Gambia. Over a period of time, you know, Uganda was really hit by HIV. And uh, in the early 1980s, we had lots of, uh, the epidemic was uh, 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 quite uh, uh, high. Lots of death, and one reason that really Uganda was able to address it is that the government was open about it, unlike some other countries, but also invited many international partners to come and work with us. But also the campaigns uh, led by the government, uh, ch uh, change in behavior, the ABC, abstinence, be faithful, condom. I think all these changes and messages did work to combat the HIV epidemic. So we had a reduction in the epidemic. But in the past about four years, there's been concern that actually this is, being, this is reversing. And uh, there have been a number of reports that show that Uganda is not doing very well against the HIV as we stand now. Actually, the 2013 global HIV epidemic uh, uh, listed a number of countries uh, be which compared between 2005 and 2013, uh, looking at the, uh, the number of new infections. In most countries, the new infections were reducing from 2005 to 2013, including South Africa, Nigeria, but it's only Uganda in the global report that indicates an increase in the number of new infections from 2005 to 2013. So this is a cause of worry to find out why really this is happening. Uh, a country that was really uh, managing the HIV epidemic uh, to see that we have this uh, worrying situ situation. So we decided in our current funding, MRC funds us every five years, this quinquennium uh, funding, 
to address the changing uh, HIV epidemic in Uganda and elsewhere in Africa to see really what is happening to the HIV epidemic currently and what is likely to happen in the coming years. I will not go through all this, but this is a summary of some of the research that we are doing that is multidisciplinary in epidemiology, describing the epidemic, intervention research so that we control and, uh, the epidemic through a number of studies that will lead to microbicides, vaccines, combination prevention, care to find cost-effective ways to manage the disease, basic research that is relevant to uh, vaccine development and to address the HIV drug resistance uh, problem, uh, social science to understand the impact of the epidemic and the driver of the, of the epidemic, co-infection studies to look at uh, other infections uh, and HIV. So we address HIV in a multidisciplinary approach. This slide shows uh, what is happening in one of the rural uh, areas that we're working. We are working, we have been, we are one of the research uh, uh, groups that have been working in the rural population for many years, about 25 years. And we went into this population because, in southwestern Uganda, because that's where the HIV epidemic was uh, uh, identified as uh, highest in the southwestern Uganda, H very high HIV prevalence, very high um, uh, death. Uh, over a period of time, uh, we reported uh, from 1990, we've been working there, we reported a decline in HIV prevalence, which was very good. And we provided information that HIV prevalence in this rural population was coming down, yeah, including HIV incidence. But around uh, uh, 2001, we started seeing uh, an increase in the HIV uh, uh, prevalence, yeah. And we want, wanted to understand why this is happening. There was a downward trend, trend and upward trend. We have also shown in this population that the HIV incidence has been coming down, but not at the same rate in the different groups. Some groups, <coughs> the, the, the incidence has come out faster than the others, but there are some groups, which uh, age groups, where uh, the incidence has remained uh, uh, constant. What we realized, or what we did when uh, uh, antiretrovirus became uh, available, we started uh, providing antiretrovirus to this population. And as you can see, the number of individuals who are on ARVs is increasing, has been increasing from 2004 to uh, 2012. What we have seen as a result is a reduction in mortality in this population. Less people are dying as a result of introduction of uh, antiretrovirus. And we think partly uh, the introduction of antiretrovirus has partly increased to the incre partly contributed to the increase in the HIV prevalence because we still have some individuals who are uh, getting infected, but a number of people are now living longer. And we have now finalized uh, uh, analysis of our data to show the uh, contribution of antiretrovirus to the increase in HIV prevalence. Of course, there are other factors in uh, migration and all that, but there's a big, big contribution of antiretrovirus to this increased HIV prevalence. So, so if you look at only HIV prevalence and you see an, inc an increase, you may think that the epidemic is getting worse. But partly because people are living longer, you can see this increase. However, for Uganda, uh, this increase in prevalence has also been, uh, uh, the increase has also been shown in some populations with the increase in HIV incidence, which we have to work on to ensure that HIV incidence uh, comes down. We have also shown that life expectancy among HIV positive individuals has increased. If you compare uh, life expectancy in men in black and women uh, in white who are HIV, uh, 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 all, 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 all um, men and women, uh, including HIV positive or negative, uh, sorry, HIV negative, this was the life expectancy of a period of time. And this was the life expectancy of HIV-infected individuals. As you can see, life expectancy was quite low uh, before the introduction of antiretrovirus, but the life expectancy has gone up. Actually, it is nearly reaching, uh, soon reaching individuals who are HIV negative. But we started seeing this increase in life expectancy even before full scale up of antiretrovirus. So that means that even improved care that uh, happened in these populations did affect 
life expectancy. But the biggest uh, effect has been the introduction of antiretrovirus. The problem has been in the rural and urban, uh, rural areas, general population, the HIV prevalence has come down. But we are seeing now, we have gone into key populations where we are seeing now very, very high HIV prevalence rates. And we have identified two populations, the fishing communities and sex workers. The fishing communities, the HIV prevalence is as high as 35%. And in one of the studies that we have done, the HIV instance is about six per hundred personal years. This is so, so, so high in this population. While in the sex workers, the prevalence is about 40%, and instance about 3.5%. This is really shows a, a changing ep uh, 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 epidemic, especially within the fishing communities. There remain pockets uh, of and source of HIV infection that we think is uh, spreading to the general population. And currently, a lot of work is going on to do modeling to find out the contribution of these communities, uh, that, how they contribute to the uh, epidemic in the general population. We have looked at these individuals, especially the uh, female sex workers and the fishing community, to look at the risk factors for HIV infection. Uh, mostly, we have seen alcohol use and STDs, uh, very, very uh, important risk factors. And the population attributed factor for H of HIV incidence for alcohol is estimated to be more than 60%. And uh, the STD, the population attribution factor for STD for HIV incidence is about 70%. So it's important to understand the risk factors so that you can address uh, interventions. The other work we are doing is really to find out why are we continuing to have transmissions in the areas we have been for many years why do we continue to have uh, HIV uh, new, new infections? But also in the key populations, why and where the new infections are coming from. Using uh, molecular uh, epidemiology and looking at virus sequences, we are looking at uh, uh, transmission uh, pair, uh, clusters uh, to look at who has infected who. And that way we are able to, deep, uh, to characterize more deeply the HIV epidemic. We have identified individuals within the household, uh, who are individuals who are uh, partners, where you find one individual is infected, but the infection is not coming from the partner, it is coming from outside the household. We have identified individuals where infections are coming from outside the communities, uh, not within the communities. We have identified infections whereby, infection, especially in the fishing communities, where infections are coming from other uh, geographical regions because of using the molecular uh, uh, virology uh, technique to find out. This can help us to address, uh, 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 intervene uh, better. If you are to do test and treat, uh, if you only do test and treat within a community, you have to understand some of the infections are likely to come from other communities. If you are addressing infection within the household, the infections may be coming from outside the household. So this information is trying to uh, allow us to understand better and, uh, and address intervention. We're conducting combination prevention, giving all the, the available uh, prevention methods that are available, circumcision, uh, treatment, condom provision, especially in these key uh, populations. We have started to uh, test and treat in some of these uh, key population. Now it's a policy within uh, Uganda that in these key populations, uh, we offer test and treat. But what we have found out immediately as t test and treat is being rolled out, many of individuals who are uh, infected and they are found to be HIV positive, they don't uh, necessarily accept uh, to enroll into treatment. Many ask that why do you enroll me into treatment when my CD4 counts are still very high. So we need to, again, to address and see how we can uh, work on the barriers to enroll into test and treat. In the area of care, we have done quite a lot of, of care, involved a number of studies uh, that are helping to roll out antiretrovirus. Uh, we have been part of the large uh, STAT trial uh, that has recommended early treatment. Uh, we have just completed another uh, important study, the COSTOP trial, that has been looking at the benefit of continuing with the cotral myxazole when the CD4 counts rise about 250. And what we find, especially in areas where we have bacteria infection and malaria, Continuation of uh, cotrimacazole uh, may, may be of, uh, of, of benefit. How is that uh, uh, support uh, the WHO policy on the use of these uh, drugs? 
We are looking at the long-term effects of LRT. Again, this is the changing HIV epidemic. People are living longer. Uh, people who are HIV uh, positive are aging. Uh, the drugs themselves have their effects on toxicity. So we have been looking at all these different uh, uh, areas to understand what the drugs are doing to our uh, patients. The, uh, now we are using as first line tenofovir, and it has its uh, effects on the renal, uh, renal toxicity. What we are finding, uh, we are finding, of course, individuals who have this, this lipidemia, hypertension, hyperglycemia, and uh, obesity. The figures are not very different from what has been found in other areas uh, in, in Africa. But what we are doing now is to compare what we see with the background, uh, 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 what, uh, in the information we have in the background population, so that we can really uh, interpret and understand the effect of these drugs. Uh, but the interesting one is tenofovir, where we expect to find high renal toxicity. The good news is that it is causing, we have not seen a lot of renal toxicity in individuals on these drugs. Drug resistance is another uh, big problem. As we roll out antiretrovirus, we have to be mindful that resistance will come in. It is inevitable. So we're doing a lot of work to survey for resistance, to find out why resistance is coming and where it is coming from. We're doing a number of studies using WHO protocols to look at transmitted drug resistance, to look at acquired drug resistance, and also to look at uh, both in adults and, ch uh, and, and, and in children. What we are finding in studies we have done over a period of time, that we still have low to moderate levels of transmitted drug resistance. So we have to watch out to find out really what is happening so that we can address these issues. We have already provided information to the Minister of Health to address policy, areas that we think could be of, uh, uh, that need to address to avoid uh, development of drug resistance. And one of them is drug stockouts. You find a number of centers, sometimes we have uh, drug, drug uh, stockouts, the issues and the issues of uh, adherence to drugs. Uh, this slide just shows you, of course, uh, most of uh, uh, the uh, individuals who have uh, uh, drug res resistance, a lot of this is due to uh, NNRTIs, uh, which, uh, uh, as, as you know, have low uh, barrier to drug uh, resistance. The most worrying one is resistance in children. This study was done some time back before HART was recommended to women, uh, as you had the minister saying that transmission to children has really come up. This work was done before that. And what was very worrying was the very, very high rates of drug resistance among children born under the PMTCT uh, uh, regimen. So if children are born HIV positive and, they're born, uh, and the mothers have taken antiretrovirus, there's a big percentage of these children who have already drug resistance. Again, the good thing is that the ministry and WHO has changed recommendation to provide uh, protease uh, regimens that contain protease inhibitors so that uh, these can be effective. We're doing quite a lot of work to understand protective immune responses to contribute to HIV vaccine development using the cohorts that we have, long-term and progressors, exposed individuals who are still negative, and individuals who are getting super infected. We have shown, like others, that HLA is important in slowing HIV disease progression. We have not been convinced that there's any immune response that is likely to be protective in individuals who are highly exposed but remain un, uh, uninfected. But we're also seeing a number of individuals who are getting super infected. You have one strain. If you are exposed, you get another strain. And we are trying to understand why some individuals get inf super infected, not the others. We are participating in a number of uh, studies that are helping to design vaccines, including vaccine trials. And recently, we have uh, uh, working with the International AIDS Vaccine Initiative. Uh, we have initiated a new program that we allow our scientists to participate fully in HIV vaccine design from very, very early stage. Previously, many uh, centers in Africa, labs. We are participating in epidemiology, clinical trials, but we want more involvement in vaccine design, early vaccine involvement, and already we are uh, moving towards that. The vaccine work in HIV has helped us to move into Ebola. We are now part of uh, uh, an ongoing Ebola vaccine trial. 
the Ebola phase one is about to be completed, and we're going to start the second Ebola uh, phase to Ebola vaccine uh, using uh, a, a product that has been made through the Johnson uh, or Johnson and Johnson using an Adeno 26 and an MVA, a prime boost uh, a, a, a regimen using the Ad26 as a Zael uh, Ebola and uh, the MVA as a Zael and Sudan type of uh, Ebola. So we have used uh, the uh, capacity that we have built in vac HIV vaccines to quickly move into Ebola uh, vaccine trials. Uh, uh, our Nobel laureate mentioned about bioinformatics, which is becoming very important. We have seized on the opportunity because we are doing a lot of what I've not discussed with you is there a lot of work we are doing in non-communicable diseases. Because as you know and as you have heard, uh, we, are, we have a changing uh, disease uh, uh, epidemic into non-communicable diseases. We are doing a lot of uh, genomics and genome, working with the collaborators in Sanga, Cambridge, and Oxford, generating a lot of data. As I've mentioned, we are doing a lot of sequencing, including using uh, next generation sequencing, which is done locally. So with all this data, we need to have the capacity to analyze the information. And we have been lucky that we are funded by the MRC with 2.5 million new uh, pounds to set up a, a, a bioinformatics center where we are going to do training, store, and analyze a lot of the uh, data that we are uh, collecting from the genome. In my last uh, uh, slides, I can't forget capacity building, which is very, very important. A lot of what I've talked about research involves capacity building because this work is done by our young scientists who have opportunities to come and work with us. We train on the job, we provide opportunities uh, for masters and PhDs and postdoc. Postdoc is still a challenge. There's very limited uh, independent funding that is available for our postdocs to apply, but also contributing to infrastructure development. We are moving towards affiliation with the universities. All this capacity building has been able to happen because of the partnerships that we have and the collaboration that we have with a number of individuals. MUI is one example of a collaboration between Makere University and uh, our institute, together with other universities, including Cambridge University, uh, where we have worked very well to train individuals. In the audience, I think we have one example of one of our interns who came, Connie, Connie has, okay, where is Connie? He's not here. But he's one of those who came as, um, on an attachment and has just completed his PhD in South Africa. Uh, he's now working at, as a postdoc uh, in, 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 in South Africa. My last two slides, I'll just briefly talk about the Ebola work we are doing uh, and other emerging infections through finding larger from CDC USA. Uh, our center, UVRI, is the National Reference Center for Vector-Borne Diseases for the National Influenza to the National Influenza Center, to the National Diagnostic Lab for highly infectious diseases like Marburg and Ebola. It's a WHO collaborating center for a number of uh, thank you. Uh, viral diseases and the WHO reference collaborating center. This out, uh, the uh, Ebola outbreak in West Africa caused uh, international attention. But we have had Ebola for many, for, for some time. Yeah, if you see here, we have had Ebola in 2000. Here, uh, Ebola infect, uh, affected about 500 individuals, and about half of those died. Did you, did you know about that, that outbreak? <laughs> did you know about it? No, not much. 2007, 2011, 2013. But West Africa, because of the numbers, it has changed things. And as you heard, a lot has been going on trying to find a vaccine, drugs, with a very, very low funding and low, low incentive for people really to address these outbreaks. We have had them for some years, but uh, it's not good, but the, the good outcome of West African outbreak is now the intensified uh, efforts on Ebola. Our labs are able to provide very quick results using serology uh, and the molecular real-time PCR. We provide results very quickly so that we can address the outbreaks as quickly as possible. Uh, we also provide these um, uh, um, services uh, to the region. Can we I have a lab minute, that please? is... Huh? Time is over, so yeah. two minutes. Yeah. Can I yeah. say one minute, please? Yes. Yeah. So this is all a contribution to policy, 
part of the contribution to policy uh, that we have had in a number of areas to address the changing HIV epidemic. So in conclusion, I think you need to understand your local epidemic so that you can address it. We have seen that ALT has led to uh, increased uh, life expectancy. We have seen we have, of course, other effects that are coming on, long-term effects of ALT and toxicities. We have to address the issues of drug resistance, others which shall have an, another epidemic. And our studies, we think, have really contributed uh, to policy. And capacity building, which we have done in partnership, has been key in our work. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thank you very much.